<laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. So glad you're here. Uh, welcome to the Artist Encounter for The World of Extreme Happiness by Francis Yachu Kawig. Um, so thrilled that you could join us for this conversation. We have just a couple of uh, housekeeping items that I wanted to address before we get started. Um, we have uh, wonderful support from many, many people who make these productions possible. And I wanted to start the afternoon with uh, noticing some of those, uh, which would be our production sponsors. Uh, the major corporate sponsor of the Owen Theater season is Edelman. Additional support provided by the season and production sponsors and the New Work and Cultural Diversity Endowment Fund donors. Our New Work uh, Endowment Grand Benefactor is Sean M. Donnelly and Christopher M. Kelly. Thank you to both of them. Uh, and just so you know, this play was originally commissioned and developed by South Coast Repertory with support from the Elizabeth George Foundation. And the World of Extreme Happiness, you may remember, some of you may have seen it, was produced in a developmental production, uh, workshop production as a part of our new stages series uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, uh, the cell phones, that's what I was going to say next, cell phones. <laughs> That, those wonderful things call, that make noise. Uh, if you could off. try to turn them <laughs> off, please. <laughs> Including you on stage. Um, it, uh, it's really wonderful not to have them go off during <laughs> performances and talks. Uh, finally, this talk will be live streamed via HowlRound. Uh, that's at HowlRound.tv. So today's conversation uh, is viewable uh, via the web. And we hopefully will have some people tuning in to see that. It will also be available to you after the fact that you can also access it uh, in retrospect uh, via the same site. Uh, so please. So if you want to like get on the internet, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if you want to tweet it right now, uh, we will be hopefully a accepting some questions from uh, folks out there via Twitter as well. So for the future, other art artist encounters, if you'd like to join us that way, you also can. Um, I will uh, finally turn it over to our artists. Uh, uh, of course, I, we have our director, um, Mr. Eric Ting, uh, our playwright, <laughs> Francis Yachu Kawig. And our moderator for today's conversation is Josh Chambers Letson. Josh. All right. Hey. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's such, I'm not, I, this isn't actually for amplification purposes, and it's terrifying because it's like coming at my face. But. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be up here, um, and in particular with, with Francis and Eric. Um, so I thought we talked a little bit beforehand about some of the questions that we'd like to address, but we're also going to be sort of free form um, and let the conversation go where it goes, which could be really dangerous, uh, hopefully, actually. Um, you know, it could end with riots, um, uh, which would be in keeping with the vision of the play to some extent. Um, but I thought I'd start just uh, for both the, those of you that are familiar with the play, but also um, for people uh, who are at home who are sort of interested in it, by asking uh, Francis first if you might tell us um, how it was that you kind of came to the conception behind uh, World of Extreme Happiness, the questions that you were interested in exploring in the play, um, and what the developmental process was in actually bringing it from the idea to the stage. Sure. I uh, was really interested in exploring uh, the world's largest migration, um, which they're happening right now internally between inside China and Brazil from rural areas to urban areas. And um, so I was interested in China. I've lived in um, Asia for about 10 years as a teenager. I lived in Taiwan, Okinawa, and Beijing and was in Beijing as a teenager just as um, they were bidding for the Olympics and got to see a lot of incredible change happening there and a lot of things that also felt really surreal um, like when they were trying to get the Olympic bid uh, the clouds were seeded so that uh, the smog would uh, wash away with rain and the trees were spray paint dead trees were spray painted green um, and there's just all kinds of just really surreal things happening um, and then later on I guess after college I had the opportunity to um, spend some time in Chengdu in central China where my father was working at the US consulate and I got the opportunity to meet a number of um, Chinese dissidents who were able to share their perspectives about China with me um, and talk about their experiences having to report on their activities to the Chinese police um, and I'm also very interested in, in um, contributing to the advancement of complex roles for Asian American um, women and 
on how they are portrayed on stage, um, like Chinese women. And so I was very invested in creating very complex Asian female roles. And that was also informing um, kind of the way I was approaching the play. I wanted to write a story about China that told the story from uh, the perspective of Chinese people that didn't have a Western lens, didn't have a foreigner, a Western interloper. That is the um, entry point for the audience. Um, so yeah, those are some initial kind of thoughts that I was having when I started the play. So can I just uh, follow up on that? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's one thing to sort of abstractly think I, I want to feature, right, Asian American women actors, right? Mm -hmm. But for those of us that have seen the play, Sunny is such an extraordinary and kind of specific character, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, literally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, how, how did Sunny come to you, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I really like Arthur Miller's essay, Tragedy and the Common Man, and I really appreciated his, uh, I guess, perspective on what makes a tragic hero. And so I gave myself the challenge of how can I make an uneducated Chinese woman a tragic hero using his kind of definition was that of a person who rails against heaven and earth at any cost to secure their rightful place in society. Um, and among um, the, the experience of a migrant worker going from rural area to urban area, just such profound change, just kind of going from these vastly different worlds. And I think I kind of understood that a little from having moved constantly throughout my childhood. Um, so I felt a little bit of an in there. Um, and I was also, as a woman who it was survived her 20s and was very familiar with kind of this culture of self-help and bootstrapping, it was very interesting to me that the most popular genre a book among migrant workers is self-help books, many of which are translated um, from Western self-help books and um, exported to China. And that idea of how self-help can be used as a form of social control was fascinating to me um, and also very dangerous, I thought, because it's a powerful form of social control if one thinks that all their problems are of their own making versus socially constructed. So to follow up on that, and I'd like to sort of expand it um, to both of you, um, uh, there's this sort of idea now to put a story that takes place uh, in China on stage and not to mediate it right through a Western um, view or frame, I should say, uh, or character, actually. Um, what kind of research did you actually have to do uh, to make the leap from that idea to actually manifesting um, a sort of image or a vision of China, which on the one hand kind of stands in for China for the audience, but on the other hand can't really stand in for China, right? Because it's a, it's a complex, enormous place um, that can't be contained within two hours on a proscenium stage. Do you want to start? You, want me to start? Uh, you can start. Um, I did a lot of research, reading lots of books um, that explored, I guess, some of the worlds that I was interested in. There's this wonderful book called Factory Girls by Leslie Chang, a Wall Street Journal reporter who lived with factory girls in Shenzhen over a period of time and really was able to kind of see how they changed and addressed their, their world and their desire to change over um, a period of several years. There's also this wonderful book by Xinran, who's a Chinese uh, radio um, journalist called uh, Letters from an Unknown Chinese Mother, where she interviews um, women who've had to give up their children, midwives who um, killed girl babies, and just really got into their perspectives. And so very often when I'm trying to get into a, a view that I don't really understand, I just try to read as much as I can um, firsthand accounts of those perspectives. Um, you know, for us, from the production perspective, um, we've really, I think, we made the choice early on to really rely on Frances's play and on Frances's research. Um, she has this amazing kind of appendix in the play uh, where she lists a, a large number of resources and sources in particular that I think we encourage everyone involved in the production to really immerse themselves in. And that there's something about that depiction of the contemporary Chinese experience that um, that, that list focused us on. Uh, more importantly, I think, finally, in the end, we, we, in the rehearsal, we started from the very beginning just acknowledging the fact that to, to open that box that you're talking about mm -hmm. is sort of to open a kind of rabbit hole mm -hmm. um, and to never really come to any sense of closure because it's so deep, it's so dense, it's so uh, convoluted and, and layered um, that 
pretty much from the beginning we said what we wanted to focus on more than anything else was just to tell the story and that and to rely um, in part on production choices and to rely in part upon a kind of pre-existing experience of the actors that were that are involved in this production to really just create that authenticity mm -hmm. um, that I think we're all chasing to make sure that Francis's words and specifically the story of Sunny Lee um, really takes off. So I'm going to jump from the word authenticity, right? In part because I hate that word. I've, I've like, you know, anytime somebody tells me that there's a restaurant with authentic food, I immediately know I shouldn't go there. Um, <laughs> because I just sort of imagine that there's this striving to create, you know, uh, it's, you know, especially I think, I know Francis and I, Eric, we haven't talked about this, but, uh, you know, I, my mother is Japanese, um, you know, Francis is, li Francis is also part Asian, has lived in Asia, and, you know, whenever somebody says something about, like, authentic Japanese food, I never know what that means, because when I go to Japan, like, there's no such thing as authentic Japanese food. There's just food, right? A lot, a lot of it. And some of it's really bad, actually, right? You know, so um, some of it's good, right? Um, um, in the same way that the idea of, like, authentic Chicago food doesn't really make any sense. So authentic is an interesting question, right? Because on the one hand, it, it, there's a kind of representational burden. How does one represent the verisimilitude of people who are having real world experiences, right? So the real world experiences of migrants um, that, are, that are moving from rural areas to places like Shenzhen to work, right? Um, without transforming that representation into a kind of stand-in for the reality of every single rural migrant, right? Or every single person living in Shenzhen. So what strategies did you guys come up with um, to tell the story uh, in a way that would not, because that's, I think, one of the strengths of the play is it doesn't universalize yeah. and say, this is the story of China, right? Or this is the story of rural workers. It says, this is a story. Um, that takes place within this context. And, and I, I imagine that there was a lot of thinking and work that you had to do to get to that place to make it really work. Yeah, um, the designers did a lot of work, in particular the costume designer, Jenny Manis, to make sure that every choice was as specific as possible. She's been doing research for six months and made the choice that she was going not going to put anything on an actor unless she could find like actual images from that specific region that the play took place that had you know Chinese people in those clothes. And I think that helped a lot at least create um, specificity. Um, and I think uh, just, I think the choices for us to make it seem more real was just to make it as specific as possible um, and make the characters not romanticized, not idealized. Sunny is very bratty and very bitchy at times throughout her journey and has to c go through, confront a lot um, and get through a lot in her own personal development before she becomes a person that we would say is does something brave. Um, and Eric has been very, very good at like chasing the actors to like always try to just be simpler, be more direct. Don't try to put all these layers on top of it that aren't there, but just just embody the character. I think um, you know, you and I should have a debate about or a conversation about the word authenticity. But I think you're right. I mean, I know we I could do I it right now. We could do it right now. No. Um, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I completely, I understand exactly what you mean by that, of course, and I think, um, I think for me, artistically, we're um, on stage, part of what stage is about is artifice, right? The, the kind of like the theater is, by its very nature, a kind of artifice, as opposed to film, which tends to have, um, tends to lean more towards verisimilitude than what we can accomplish on stage. And so where we seek truth in the theater is in the performances, right? It's in the story that's being told. And it's in the way that the people that we recognize on stage are living within those stories. Um, and either we believe it or we don't. And if we believe it, then we have empathy for that. And that, that empathy then carries us towards, um, I think, what is all, all that is good in the theater, about the theater. Um, I do think, though, that that's the question, right? There's a sort of like, so Mimi Lian, who's our set designer, for instance, is also constantly engaged with this idea of, of what is real versus what is unreal, right? So, so that if she has an opportunity to select materials that are creating the space within which the play is set, she will much rather choose real materials. Like, mm -hmm. so you'll go into our set and you'll see was essentially a dirty concrete box. And if Mimi had had her way, it would have been real concrete. And, um, but, uh, but that's, you know, that would have collapsed the stage in the Owen, so we didn't do that. But, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but there's something about this idea of creating a space where we don't, um, where the characters, the stories of these characters can exist unencumbered 
right, by the burden of, of telling something larger. You know, we, uh, the conversation is often about specific universality through specificity. Mm. Um, and so a lot of it was, it was great to have Francis in the room because Francis was constantly answering our questions about sort of like, well, where do they come from? Is there a specific village that you have in mind? You know, um, sort of like, what is the nature of, of their work? What is the nature of their everyday? Um, and to the extent that the actors um, have been able to sort of let go of the burden of telling a kind of cultural story, mm -hmm. but rather, you know, just been able to sort of come together to tell this one story. Um, the hope is, of course, that that's what we connect with, that what we connect with finally in the end is um, a kind of reality that is unfolding in the course of the play. Um, and that, that, that create, and I guess authentic for me is like, I know I don't, I don't have the kind of, I don't have the same sort of adverse response to the word, mm. but, um, there's something about that sense of, of honesty that we're constantly chasing. All right. That's interesting. Uh, I feel, you know, I shouldn't have made authentic the red herring. It's just, to me, <laughs> I, I mean, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's like my skin crawls, but at the same time, I think there is this question about how do you actually tell stories that are, tr you know, true to some extent, yeah. even if they're fantastic, right? Yeah. Um, well, that was like my first response in reading. I remember when I first read Francis's play, kind of, because, you know, I think we hear stories. Like we hear in the West, in, in this country, we hear, like, there, there's a way of unpacking Francis's story, the play, where there's sort of like, there's, there's just certain, there's a topicality, mm. right? Sort of in, f 